It's really a pleasure for me today to, one, have a conversation. That's what this is going to be about community and, and really about more than that. And I'll go into that a little bit more after introducing um, both Nicholas and Tanya. A short introduction. Nicholas Gl Glannon is from Sitka, Alaska. Uh, also went to, uh, he went on to receive his uh, bachelor's degree at London Guildhall University and then to New Zealand for your MA in Indigenous Visual Arts. That's, that's, that's a journey. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, and Tanya, uh, an, it's okay. I can't believe I didn't <laughs> have you heard. Right. You practiced <laughs> the entire Aginiga. time. We it's Tanya Aguiniga. Yeah. <laughs> who um, got her bachelor's degree at San Diego State University um, in, in, in furniture design and MF, MFA in ISD in furniture de design as well. Mm -hmm. Now this panel is a little bit different because we're really reliant upon context. I mean, there's a lot of broad things around process and institution, and, but to really understand a bit more about each one of these artists and how we think about community, we really need to know a bit more about their journey, a bit more about how we even arrive at this point at being on this stage. The other thing is that this isn't going to be a conversation about social practice or community engagement per se, but rather that inherently craft and making has always been connected to identity and community and who we are. So we really want to dig into those things in response to how that, how that manifests in making and how it, the two work together. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is just start a conversation. We, we've, we've talked a few times, and I just I want to know a bit more. I'm a, like curious George. So it's like this thing where uh, I'm super fascinated by both of the kind of journeys at which you arrived. Um, and Tanya, like, like you started off in furniture design. Uh -huh. And so then what, how does, or actually even, actually even more interesting to me is, is how you were, you, you were raised uh, in Tijuana yeah. and then went to school in San Diego, and that border existence. Talk more yeah, about that. So, um, yeah, I don't know how many of you guys know yeah, about my, my weird story. but um, So I lived in Tijuana until I was 18, but then started going to school in the US when I was four. So for 14 years, I crossed the border every single day um, to study in the US. Um, and it wasn't because my parents wanted me to study in the US. It was because they didn't have a babysitter. And my grandma happened to live on the US side. Um, and so it was just kind of by default that I ended up crossing the border. Um, and we were talking about community work and stuff um, these last couple of days. Um, so crossing the border every single day, especially in the 80s, was a really horrible thing, especially as a child, um, because it was when there would be thousands of um, migrants trying to jump over the fence to run into the US. Um, and so then on the way to school, we would constantly see people getting run over. And so it was a really difficult thing for me to deal with as a child, um, just how much people sacrificed to get to the US. Um, and so it was something that weighed really heavily on me that because I was a US citizen, I had the right to come and go and that there was this like really massive sense of privilege that one has just because of our citizenship. Um, and so I eventually, when I was 18, um, you know, because I, I had such a different upbringing than the rest, than my peers in, you know, K to 12. Um, I also couldn't tell anybody that I lived in Mexico because I would get kicked out of public school. So I had to use uh, fake addresses so that I could stay in whatever school district I was going to school in. Um, and so when I was 18, I started working with a border art workshop, and that was in community college because I wasn't always like honors classes and stuff, but because my parents didn't go to college and you know dropped out of school really early uh, in Mexico, um, I didn't know how to go about like I didn't have money for an SAT, for AP test, all of that stuff. So I ended up in community college. Um, and so in community college, I met my mentor, Michael Schnorr, who was one of the founding members of the Border Art Workshop. And so I started doing um, a lot of community-based projects that were using art as a vehicle, not just for community empowerment, but to solve really, really heavy mm. problems that were going on in Tijuana. And so, um, and I'll try to like be quicker about all this business. But um, so I, for six years, co-built and co-ran a community center made out of trash from the US in a land squat run by women who, it was the only surviving autonomous community outside of um, Chiapas. They had ties to the Zapatista movement, which is 
movement for indigenous rights in southern Mexico. And so the land that they were squatting on, according to Mexican agrarian reform law, was legally theirs. Um, but the Mexican government hated that they were there when the property started becoming more valuable um, as maquiladoras moved in around them. And so then they would tie chains around people's houses, yank them out with semi-trucks, set people's houses on fire, stone women and children. There was false imprisonments. There was assassinations we were dealing with. And so all of this stuff we were bringing attention to and dealing with through art. And so for six years before I studied furniture design and then also while I was studying furniture design, I was also doing this really, really heavy, heavy. How do you, like, so what's so interesting to me, and then we'll, we'll kind of shift back and forth, is like, oftentimes there's like a, like I, I think people are like, I think I want to do community work. Yeah. <laughs> like this is an absolute response to your environment. Yeah. And, and then there's this, and I, I was really struck by how your, your, your mother remarked um, um, how living in Mexico is so that you stay connected mm -hmm. to that yeah. directly. And then you go to San Diego State yeah. and study furniture. Yeah. And then, and then balancing those, those two things, right? Like you, it, maybe it wasn't a balance, but saw, a lot of your work was really also very specific. And you talk about this, like there's this orderly side and there's this material side. Yeah. There. And so for a long time, um, because I was dealing, and I was also working at the San Diego Museum of Art in the education department, trying to increase the like diversity in museums and giving out scholarships to kids. Um, so I was super busy, and so then um, I was dealing with such heavy stuff in the community, like really horrible, horrible, you know, when you come in and somebody that you are really close to has been assassinated, it's a really difficult thing wow. to deal with. So furniture was this really, like, meditative, like I can be super anal and control a world that outside of this is really chaotic. Right. You know, so I would just, like, nerd out with my square and my, like, sandpaper. <laughs> And it was awesome, wow. you know? And it's so like, then, yeah. so I kept stuff super separate. And um, I got into furniture because I was always really artistic, but I felt really guilty about spending a bunch of time on something that seemed so luxurious and lofty and like not like blue collar, you know, like clothes. Your dad was a, like he, my dad was a ship, a ship grinder. Like a ship grinder. Yeah, so they would strap a 40 pound grinder to his body and throw him over the side of a battleship. So then he would weld all of the welds, grind all the welds on battleships in the US with his body. Um, large scale. Large scale grinding, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's one of those things where I was like, well, if I like become a really good welder, like my dad and my uncles will give me some props. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's, right. uh, yeah, so that's how I started with functional. Right. work and it wasn't until I moved away and went to RISD that I like my world collapsed and then I was like oh shit everything's like yeah. one now and so then right. the furniture started to take on more context and it's been a really slow process of me like letting go of the guilt and allowing myself to get sculptural to make stuff that has deep meaning without function Right, and the two, I think, are just so beautifully come together now and how you think about ideas and how yeah. they come together. Um, so your experience in Alaska, and then you, so like, so when, I'm always curious about when people start making stuff. And so how is that connected to where you're from and your? Well, I, I, I was uh, surrounded by artists in my family. So my great grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, my uncle, my father, did a lot of cultural clinket, uh, wood carving, jewelry. Mm -hmm. So I knew about this, and um, I was I, I was doing this as a child. So right. you know, I, I was practicing the our visual aesthetic. Like lineage, part of it, yeah, definitely. I was trying to understand it too. Uh, there's such a disconnect in our communities um, through the genocide of Native America, with removal of our tongue, removal of our education process, removal of our land, our resources, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And it reflects in our work and, and, um, and it reflects in our communities. It reflects in my um, father's language, which is not Tlingit. He was raised speaking Tlingit, but he doesn't anymore. Um, right. There was the shame that came with that from the grandparents that didn't want him to speak the language so that he would force assimilate into our society smoothly. Right. So um, all of these things. and. Um, 
I picked up the cultural artwork as a, I guess when I was 18, I really threw myself at it um, right. as a form of learning more about my history, learning about my where I come from, learning about the land, the connection to where we're from is really deeply rooted in what we do and how we exist and how we subsist and feed our families. So um, I was working at the park service. Uh, my, this is my last job as a, <laughs> just, you know, a regular job, I guess. And uh, I was 18 years old, and my job was to greet visitors that came into this old Russian bishop's house, which is like a historical building in our community. And um, literally, when there was nothing to do, I would, ha I would have to just sit at the desk and wait for visitors. So I it was like, perfect. I said, oh, draw and practice drawing this uh, clinket art form. And um, I had my sketchbook. And my boss came in and said, you can't do that. You can read Russian history books but you can't do it and I was uh, I was out of there so yeah yeah and then so I'm really so I'm just imagining you, you fly to fly to London yeah I was you get off the plane you go to school and what happens so you get <laughs> culture shock <laughs> sick Alaska is 8,000 people so that's this is my first time leaving um, leaving the country besides Canada and, and Mexico um, so um, yeah, that was a shock. I went to the university there, and the irony of what happened as well, you know, I was carrying all this um, passion for my cultural heritage with me. Um, and when I got into the curriculum there, they literally said, you can't do this work. It's too literal hmm. for us in our program. And I didn't know how to respond, so I didn't do any of that work. I kept a sketchbook and my other work and ideas that I didn't bring to. Uh, to that program, and there's a lot of irony in that because these same institutions that are, we're told we should attend to reach success in these communities will not let us bring our own culture through those doors. Um, these same institutions echo the residential schools with, within our native communities. So um, there still needs to be a lot of change in all of these facets. So, uh, so you're. I can imagine your, your, in what ways was that, was it also formative? I mean, being in that environment, like did it, how did that, did it? It was good. I mean, I'm, I make the best out of all these situations. So <laughs> I was in the heart of it, you know? Um, right. And uh, I learned a lot. Um, I created jewelry from a neutral standpoint, mm -hmm. which was. From a, from a neutral yes, standpoint. Yes, which is non, I cultural. could not use any of my cultural, yeah. Wow. Uh, um, and so th there was that, and that was fine. I could hang. So right. uh, after after London, yeah. Um, when I, you know, I didn't know how to respond to that either as a young s student. Um, I continued on with my masters in New Zealand, um, and the course was Maori visual arts. I wasn't going to study Maori visual arts. I was working with Maori artists. And everything we did was okay. And my instructor, the head of the program, wanted me to succeed. I could, see, I could mm. feel it from the way he directed us. I didn't have any of that in, in the UK while I was over there. And um, that's where a lot of the practice still uh, that I create continues from that. Extends so, from Yeah, it extends directly from that. So. Yeah, one thing that's, I mean, just in both of like your response to your the environment you exist in, how you, like both of your responses when you move out of, the, like we shift into environments and we start to, we, we start to become part of other communities. We start to be, I mean, we're, in fact, we talk about the clay, the, the craft community. What, how do we define that? Are we part of the craft community? Am I part mm -hmm. of the craft? You know, the, all of those conversations are interesting, and I'm, and and one of the things about that is how we how we engage with people to participate in what we do, and I think there's interesting ways that you both have done that. Um, so I know, I mean, so many of your projects, Tanya, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, the Felt Me project mm -hmm. um, is particularly, and it'll scroll through and you'll see this, um, which is a very intimate project. So could you maybe just describe that project a little bit? Yeah, and then I wanna... so hopefully it'll come up like soon in the round, but it's a project. So for a long time, um, I was known for these felt chairs that I would make. So it was folding chairs that I would um, wet felt. And so part of wet felting, um, you know, is rubbing. And so it's like agitation, lubrication with um, 
with wool, but then some parts of chairs are actually like pretty sensual mm -hmm. when you're rubbing them. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when people would see me do these chairs, they would automatically like over sexualize <laughs> and like, oh, can you felt anything? And, like hairy dudes <laughs> were like, can you felt me? You know, and I was like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> let me do my work. Um, but I mean, it's part of like us anthropomorphizing anthropomorphizing chairs, Yes. you know? And so... Um, <laughs> That's coming up in just a couple images. Yeah, and so then I kept having, you know, all these thoughts about like being objectified and also not just as an artist, but as like a Latina and as a lot of times I end up being a trophy Mexican. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kept thinking about all of these things. And um, so then I thought, well, why don't I do to myself what I do to my chairs and put mm. myself through the same process that I put my work through to experience what the objects themselves experience. So it's this first image, I think. Um, but then also as a way to engage the community that supports my work, that sometimes objectifies me, mm. um, to make a piece with me by engaging with my skin. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was, I don't remember how many um, volunteers were coming in and out, but it was five hours of me naked, being wrapped in wool and wet felted. Um, and my husband and family were in charge of like the crotch, but everything else was, <laughs> well, because we, we knew we were like, I don't right. know, I mean, right. so someone maybe wants to go there, but we knew like, if nobody goes there, I'm gonna end up with like a saggy exposed crotch. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so then everything That's else- That's the reverse people, of not wanting to draw that. Right. Yeah, yeah, so people were like, ugh. Um, so anyways, we, that, we gave them that job, but then everybody else could come in and do whatever. And so it was um, supporters of my work, collectors of my work, gallerists, students, interns, and my family. So in some way, there was a level of trust within, within the community that was doing this. Yeah, and so we you know, put it on social media so that anybody that wanted to come and be a part of it could come and be a part of it. Hmm. But for the most part, everybody was a little, I think, shy to engage with my skin because it's this very you know, intimate experience where, yeah. you know, and um, there's a really beautiful video that was made of it. It's on YouTube um, where you see someone like attacking my nipple with a squirt gun. Yeah. So some people like, like took it a little too far. It's like far. the cut piece of, yeah, yeah, it's like really a, cute. <laughs> but, um, it was this really interesting project because there was, like in a lot of my work, I um, explore a lot of like materiality, a lot of like the process, the communal process of making something and the conversations that happen and the relationships that develop while we're making something. Right. Um, and it was the first time that I got my point across super clearly in a way that I had never gotten my furniture to. Mm -hmm. You know, and so then at that point I kind of really like more deeply understood the power of um, like pushing my own discipline and my own um, relationship to materials. Right. Um, yeah, I think of that piece as being such a beautiful like connecting point between mm -hmm. your furniture design and your community um, work. Yeah. Um, yeah. They come together right at that point. Yeah, and then I think one thing that I think is really important to mention. Um, so, yeah. So I. I yeah, haven't made furniture in a little while. I still do every once in a while. Um, and then I had like gone into textiles for a little while, but then, um, so my mentor, Michael Schnorr, uh, committed suicide. And so then at that point is when I started doing a bunch of the performances. Wow. And a lot of it was because I knew I had been trained for so much. And I knew that, you know, a lot of the, the processes that the Border Art Workshop would use to talk about art, to talk about really um, like deep problems, um, you know, because like Guillermo Gomez Peña, all of these like like Coco Fusco, all these really amazing performance artists came out of the Border Art Workshop, and so I just felt like um, I had been given so many amazing tools, mm -hmm. and I, at some point I needed to like stop, think about my process, and think about do I need to just make nice things for rich people or do I need to like kick ass mm -hmm. with really powerful shit? Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so as a <laughs> really powerful shit, right? Not, so that, not that furniture can't be super powerful <laughs> shit, but uh, yeah. Yeah, but it really brings together 
life experience, yeah. life transition, all of these things, yeah. right? And then we all, we're, we're like, the, then we keep building. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, you are working on a canoe project. I am, yeah. So let, what's, I mean, I know a bit about it, but I, I, like, so how does this work? What is the process? And this is, um, and I'll, this is also interesting, something Tony said earlier about the uh, multiple lanes or layers of practice mm. and how they start to merge um, into, I don't know, something more cohesive, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I've, I had a similar experience um, with my training and the work that I created and the works that were immediately separated from the start of my education, formal education anyways. Um, and it was a slow like meld of into, mm -hmm. like I, I consider everything creative that I create as c coming from the same space. So right. it's usually the audience that separates it for their own personal mm -hmm. needs. And, um, we, but yeah, we're working on a canoe right now in Sitka. It's um, a 20, almost 28 foot dugout canoe. It's a customary um, Northern style um, canoe. And we've, uh, this is the third one to come out of our community in 100, probably 150 years. Wow. Um, and the reason why it's the third one is because of all of the, the colonial uh, mm -hmm. colonization, that process of um, displacement. And um, so it's a joy to be in that continuum and that lineage. And the other two canoes that came out were also created by my family. Um, we're almost done. We've, got, we've been working on it for, for nine months almost. So. I got a Skype view of it the other day. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> basically you hollow out the, the canoe and then you steam it open and you get a, a wider, more seaworthy uh, vessel. And these canoes are, all, are really um, the high, one of the highest forms, and I would say in our customary art, because of their necessity and usefulness and how they have to operate a certain way in our treacherous waterways in uh, southeast Alaska. So they feed our families. Um, they ca carry us to uh, other uh, kuiks, our potlatches, um, bring us to war, and all these different things, trade, et cetera. And, and so they were a magnificent design by necessity. And, um, and the process, it's, it's a park service and a heritage? It is, yeah. It's, it's, um, it, it was funded by Sea Alaska Heritage and then the National Park Service. So. And you have, I, so the process, you also have intern, you other people working with you. Yeah, there's five, five of us total. So. We're working on it. Yeah. So this, this thing that's can, like uh, um, maintaining, moving forward a traditional. Certainly, yeah, making. it is. It is um, just the, the, that, like customary, our, our education was master apprentice historically. Right. And if you break that um, format, I always thought like the, the arts in our community really represented um, the health of our community. And um, mm -hmm. when missionaries came through, et cetera, uh, our art reflected that through, mm -hmm. through uh, the changes that were happening. And um, not that it had any less significance, but it lost that direct master apprentice. Um, and that being said, there's been a whole era where we've got now non-native anthropologists, people that are not from our community and our culture who specialize in, uh, in our work and in our, in, in our objects. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects all across the U.S., mm -hmm. across Russia, um, Europe. Um, these are cultural objects that we created that were stolen mm -hmm. or removed or sold by um, a community that generally would never sell or have to sell these things. Mm -hmm. So not made as commodity, made as certainly, yeah. And there's a whole shift in that, the cultural economy of right. what we create today even. So um, being part of the canoe is a, a joy to um, have a different value of time, I guess, in what we are creating. Um, and it's also ironic because the instructor of the canoe is non native. So so I, I have um, he's a very knowledgeable man, but there's a lot of uh, baggage that needs to be unpacked in this conversation mm -hmm. of who is creating our artwork, who is um, selling our artwork, 
there's commercial galleries that have that sell native art mm -hmm. as if it's a, um, an aesthetic only or as if it's a fashion or if it's something that you can just come and make native art but that's not the case all of our work had meaning in our communities our masks were created to connect our um, community to the supernatural world um, all of these things had so much more use and value than um, your summer home decor so your summer home decor yeah right yeah nah. so you so I like that you said about these multiple streams uh, you know you have this base you're coming from there's all there's what, lots of ways that you work because I really am interested in how you talk about indigenous work yeah. and then we talk about white carver yeah which could you could uh, this yeah. is a piece that needs to be unpacked. I, it's because it's it's really it's part of the same conversation. It is all. It's a so so the there's a photo that'll come up here with a um, a young man who's um, loves. Next, actually. He 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 was given a few books uh, on Northwest. There he is yeah. on uh, Clinket culture, and he just loved the totem poles and the masks. Um, and he loved him so much that he started carving. He got really good. So now he carves um, native art. He's a native artist. Um, and in his studio space there, he has, uh, he's working on a piece right now. And the piece he's working on is um, a replica of a piece that I created. And the piece that I created is obviously authentic native artwork because I'm authentic. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I created, uh, a pocket pussy, which is um, a portion of a woman, but not all of it. So it's like you just want one thing and not the the rest of it. Um, and that's on display in the museum display case as native art, and that's what he's creating live as as we go. Um, so it's a similar idea that you can you can from a p privileged perspective you can pick and choose what it is that you want from a from us, but when it comes down to missing and indigenous, uh, m missing indigenous murdered women up in, the, in U.S. and Canada, or the fight up in North Dakota right now with the pipelines, or um, the suicide epidemics that are happening, where are you, and what what are you doing for those communities? What's your role in those communities besides replicating and mimicking or misappropriating our objects for your commercial? Um, benefit and these people are selling these in galleries and um, as native objects to patrons who love native culture mm -hmm. but get it from the uh, I bought two books um, at the bookstore one of the books I didn't bring was called white Indian boy so um, which is kind of ironic in this conversation of white carver and then the other one was um, art and Indian individualists. And that, that to me also is uh, ironic in the f history of our native communities and our native artists always being nameless and always being um, just Pan-American, like push, pushed into one big pile of, uh, I don't know, Indian art. So uh, the fact that there's Indian individualists, but there's not, European individualists is problematic to me, so. And I guess to that same point um, about things that are missing and how people want us yeah. um, and want parts of us, um, I also do need to mention that, um, mm -hmm. so I get asked to be part of lots of conferences, speaking things, lectures, workshops, a bunch of stuff um, by all kinds of institutions. Um, and I'm only ever asked to do community-based or talk about my community-based work. So um, it's pretty problematic, especially in museums when they want you to come and solve their brown problem, but they won't show your work inside of the museum. And so it's um, yeah. also something that people should think about more and about um, a way to increase diversity is to like involve, like let us in the door. Don't just keep us outside. Um, but yeah. So yeah, I and I think that's a good segue into like yeah. institution. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
like into the idea of institution was something I wanted to, to, to talk about. So the, um, both of your work exists both in and outside of institutional mm -hmm. realms, walls. Um, and you, so you just brought up one way that you see it is very problematic and how yeah. you're invited to do these kinds of projects because mm -hmm. this is what you're successful at. Um, how do you, how is the institution, how, how do you think of, I think of institutions as communities. How do you think of the different institutions that you work with? Like you show in uh, museums in Alaska and then all of a sudden that idea will move to uh, an institution in Los Angeles and how does that change the meaning of the work or how do, how do institutions, how does it affect the meaning of your work? I mean, I kind of just see it as an opportunity to get, to give more people like me and all of the different communities that I represent a sense of agency. You know, because not only do I represent um, like being a woman, I am also a mother. I'm Mexican, Mexican American, Chicana, many things. Um, I'm an educator. You know, there's so many different communities that I belong to. Um, you know, I'm a furniture designer, even though I don't make furniture no more. But you know, I have all these different communities. And I feel like unless, unless people in all of those different communities that I represent can see themselves mirrored in um, power roles and in those that lead us, people aren't gonna know that that's an option for them to have in their life. So as the mother of a little woman, mm -hmm. um, unless she sees people like me out there, she's not gonna know that she can do that as a job. You know, so I, whenever I work in any situation, institution, whatever it is, I just take it as a platform mm -hmm. to help bring some of the voices of those that have not been allowed to speak and amplify it a little bit, you know? So for me, it's just, yeah, a platform for more agency. Yeah, and I was struck by how, and we've talked a little, like you, you, you make, you, you make, you make, you make a body of work that you sell mm -hmm. to do work that really strikes a sort of, that, that allows you to do the work that's really, me like really meaningful to yeah. you in that way. Well, I mean like, good like soul work most of the time doesn't pay you know and <laughs> so then you gotta hustle to be able to do that right yeah institutions yeah well <laughs> I, I'll, I'll preface this by saying I, I first encountered your work for my son yeah. because he saw the image if you saw the image of um, Princess Leia mm. and a historical image of a Native American woman combined he brought his iPhone and showed me this image yeah. I'm not sure he's Six, 15, so he, he found this image, yeah. and I found it was like this beautiful full circle to meet you. So your work is moving across all kinds of platforms. Yeah, our, our, our relationship with institutions indigenously is very different than uh, yeah. a lot of non-indigenous or white males, I guess, mm -hmm. that are in 70-something percent of major museums, et cetera. Our relationship is that our ancestors' graves were often pillaged or dug, and the bones were placed in these institutions, or the bones were placed in uh, these institutions next to dinosaur bones and ethnographic collections, and the, the objects were free fodder for modern artists to find their inspiration from. Um, so we have, I have, uh, I don't wait for institutions at all, and I never define success by institution. Um, I operate within them as a platform, like mm -hmm. you said. It's a great space oftentimes to get into new communities and dialogue with, mm -hmm. with new communities. Um, but they also tend to be about 10 years behind yeah. the work that's being made and et cetera. So, so they wanna show things that that they think, is, they want to show it, things that you've already it's made. It's just a obviously. slower clock, I right. get it, uh, yeah. with, within the mechanisms of those places. But yeah, yeah, generally like 10 years or so, so. Yeah, and I think one thing too for like working with institutions that I think a lot of times they don't think about, like they want to bring all these different communities in, mm -hmm. but then they're not prepared for when they actually arrive, <laughs> you know? And so then like having like 
things that are translated, like didactic uh, having stuff. Like having Spanish language or whatever, yeah. like, yeah. Taco so, you know, trucks so on every corner. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Taco <laughs> trucks on every corner. Um, but, yeah, but it's, you know, like, if they do want to engage, like, our communities, they also need to, like, think about it as a longer-term plan. Right. You know, than, like, singular exhibitions or... Like, it can't be yeah. just simply a response to a grant call. Exactly. If right? There's a grant like, call from the NEA, from the NEA. Yeah. now we will do this, yeah. and now we will make that happen. Yeah. 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 So, how do you, like, so I'm always interested, I don't know how to define my community. I don't know what I am or where I exist probably because we're such a strange global world, right? Yeah. Um, I only knew that, for instance, when I was in Brazil, where I lived, where I, I didn't live, I stayed for five weeks, and um, an apparently white dude walking in a high African and indigenous population, I remember saying, like, you know, how, I just want, how do I fit in better? And, and, and I love the line that I got back, which is, Michael, you cannot remove your gringo. Right, you cannot remove, and so I'm always like I'm always interested in that kind of like how how do you define community, and how does and maybe and, and I you've talked a little bit about how that affects what you make, but communities are not just where we live, but how do you think about community and how do you what's how do you define that for your own work and so, I mean my my community my, that I'm rooted in deeply is is the community that uh, comes from my land. Uh, the Clinket community and the Unanga community, and we have 15,000 years of history there. Mm. So there's a deep connection in a process like this canoe, which is 800 years in the making because the log was growing for 800 years before we honored it by turning it into something that our community is going to be using. So uh, to me, that community is the, the youth that's um, here to um, watch us attempt to learn and re revive this art form and to hopefully pass it on to them again, uh, my children, and, and et cetera. That, that's the community that um, I immediately identify with, I suppose. But then there's, the, we're in a, we've got a community of makers here right now, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of different facets to, to it all, so, yeah. Yeah. For me, um, growing up on the border, um, you know, because we're like most of the time, like either the like armpit or the asshole of Mexico in Tijuana mm -hmm. on the border, uh, Mexico City being the belly button. <laughs> and so um, we are in this like really weird place that doesn't have a lot of culture. Like we are not that Mexican. We're also not American. We're just this weird ass like purgatory. Mm -hmm. And so um, my identity has always been really fluid, especially because like having to operate in and out of the two countries every single day. Um, I think for me, a lot of like labels are more a person's projection of what they need put onto me, mm -hmm. you know? And so when people are like, oh, so what are you like an artist, designer, uh, whatever, you know, I'm like, I am whatever you need me to be right now, you know? And so for me, I think when, um, I don't know, yeah, when people ask me that stuff, because there's a lot of stuff that, um, like I know, like, oops, like I'm part of really, you know, like really specific communities. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I just am. And like, mm -hmm. if people are nice and I can be part of their community too, you know, like, I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think I that know. goes, but I mean, what you said earlier, um, that what the work that you want to do doesn't pay. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you see that being sustainable? Like, what do you, how, like, what's, because I, th I mean, I, you have a professional practice and it's yeah. working. And I think there's a lot of people that want to do work that's more connected to these, to, to yeah. things that you're. I spend a lot of time grant writing. Lots. So I do tons We're actually going to pass the hat here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do tons of grant writing. And then I also do a lot of residencies and right. I do a lot of stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, right now, it's been. Um, a lot of the larger projects have been funded through large grants mm -hmm. and then building up a community of uh, really nice supporters with money, right. you know, um, and like fiscal sponsors and things like that. And I don't worry too much about like, how do I keep doing it? You know, cause I just do it. Cause I mean, I'm going to do it whether I have money or not. Right. It's just like, am I going to do the like super 
like Mickey Mouse MacGyver style of the project or it's going to be amazing and have a catalog and travel and you know right so yeah. I guess this is like a maybe a really complex question in a way to end on but it's also something I think that it's at the heart of it so what I, I think about work that both of you do is being um, the ability to, to shift scales for large large issues large conversations and to in a beautiful way reduce it or bring it down to a very, um, the image of, of Princess Leia and the historical image of an indigenous woman, the moment I saw that image, I, had to, I immediately reconciled with appropriation. Yeah. Like immediately, there is, and, and so um, how, I guess the, 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 the question is, um, is that something Something that's needed, obviously, right now in our political climate is how we actually are human beings together, yeah. like how we exist and how. And you know, I think one of the problems with community-based art or whatever you want to call it, or art that connects to community is that there's a sense that we're just going to make things really nice and everybody's just going to get along. But in fact, that image I needed to be like struck. Yeah. I didn't need to be kind of nuanced into the reality of that image. I needed to be hit with it. Certainly some efficiency in, in being direct in the right ways, I suppose. So some, some of these pieces um, perform that better than others, I would say. And some of them are more poetic in the unfolding of what, what's going to be re revealed to the viewer. Or, so, yeah. And in your music as well, right? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, man.